From the beginning of his time on Earth, man has always been fascinated by monsters, real or imagined. One enduring modern legend tells of creatures similar to man, walking upright, covered with hair, beast-like in character. Many believe they are real and exist today in the remote corners of the world where they have been driven by encroaching civilization. They were first known as the Abominable Snowmen. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. He has spent the last 20 years of his life searching for a creature so elusive that few have ever seen its tracks, and even fewer, the creature itself. Peter Byrne believes he has come close to the creature on more than one occasion. He has never actually seen the sure-footed beast that has been glimpsed in primitive surroundings. But as civilization pushes deeper into the wilderness, Byrne believes a confrontation with man is inevitable. The civilized world first became aware of such creatures when stories began to drift back from travelers in the remote Himalayas. As early as 1857, giant footprints were spotted. In 1906, a man-like creature walking upright on two legs was seen in Sikkim by English explorer H.J. Elwes. But the subject was not taken seriously until a group of British climbers attempted to be the first to reach the top of Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. In 1953, Queen Elizabeth's coronation in London was matched by news that Edmund Hillary's expedition, led by Colonel John Hunt, had reached the summit of Mount Everest. Later, headlines stated that the expedition had sighted footprints of some enormous two-footed creature and sent back photographs to prove it. The world was fascinated. The creature was dubbed the abominable snowman, and he became a household word. In 1953, Peter Byrne was one of those who heard the stories and was attracted to the subject. He made his first trek into the Himalayas. To be involved in the hunt, he had to abandon one career to begin another. He left the Royal Air Force and worked in Darjeeling, northern India. While I was there, I became interested in big game hunting. Tiger, leopard, buffalo. Then we hunted in the dense jungles that run along the edge of the Himalayan foothills. Then, in 1968, he stopped. He simply did not want to destroy beautiful animals just to put them on a wall as a trophy. I left hunting and went into conservation wildlife conservation. I could never kill again. Because of his expertise in tracking animals, he was a natural choice to lead the first scientific search for the abominable snowman, an expedition financed by Texas oil millionaire Tom Slick. Slick was killed in a plane crash, but by that time, Byrne had caught the snowman fever and has devoted his life to the search. 
this is uh, the greatest hunt that anyone could ever go on. A mysterious creature, uh, elusive, uh, shy, uh, nocturnal, um, living in an enormous area of extremely difficult terrain, and uh, it's a it's, it's a near impossible dream. To see one of these creatures would be like uh, meeting a man uh, stepping out of the primeval world, um, a prehistoric being. It would be like reaching back into the past. This is what keeps me going. This is the spare. The search has taken him into some of the most spectacular scenic areas of the world, to breathtaking vistas of natural beauty. They alone make the search worthwhile. It is here that Byrne believes the man-beast will be found. Here in the Himalayas, at the very roof of the world, Mount Everest itself. Many believe the abominable snowman originated in Nepal and Tibet, migrated northwest into China, and eventually crossed over the frozen Bering Straits into Alaska, continuing down into the Pacific Northwest. In the Museum of the University of British Columbia, Peter studies American Indian legends which tell of a similar creature the Indians call Sasquatch, the same man-beast called Bigfoot today. The Indians had no doubt he existed, and as they did with all living things, they treated Sasquatch with respect. Sacred totems symbolize the Indians' deep reverence for nature. They accorded to all living things a divine spirit. Theirs has always been a, a reverence for life. To them, the Sasquatch was no imagined demon. If we are to convince modern science that the man-beast exists, we must learn how it lives and where it hides. Peter's search next takes him to London, which has always been a center for abominable snowman study because of England's close association with India and the Himalayas. He has come to hear first-hand stories from a group of highly respected scientists and mountain experts, including John Hunt, now Lord Hunt, leader of the 1953 expedition, Dr. Michael Ward, physician to the original climb, and a world-leading mountain climber, Don Willens. The round robin of their stories is fascinating. The first time I uh, remember um, having seen the tracks of the AT was before the war. And this, Mike, I think you would agree that at that time nobody was particularly interested commercially in the... This is in the 30s. In the 30s, yeah. in 1937, when I was on a very small uh, expedition up the Zimu Glacier underneath the east face of Kanchenjunga. It was interesting because these tracks were heading for a very high and quite difficult to reach call called the Zemu La at about 19,500 feet. And there were two tracks side by side. When we got to the top of the call, the extraordinary thing was, it was a, a knife edge of ice, a quite reasonable slope on one side, but it was a, an ice cliff on the other, that the tracks were visible below us on the steep side, on the south side, and they, the, the creatures, whatever they were, had crossed the car. So that was the first time I had evidence of that, and the supporting evidence was that only a year later, Bill Tillman was in that area, uh, not knowing about the evidence I'd produced, or what I'd seen, he saw exactly the same thing, except that it was one single pair of tracks going on the same route, in the same direction, and crossing the car. And I spent nine months in the Himalaya from September to, um, through to June uh, at uh, in the Everest region at 19,000 feet doing, uh, doing medical research. And during this period, we came across two lots of tracks. In the center of the uh, tracks attributable to the Yeti, there were another series of footprints which are very much more obvious with my ice axe beside. My ice axe is approximately 12 to 14 inches long. And you can see the footprints are very clearly etched in the snow. We followed these for about 100 yards down the glacier, but we could see them continuing on into the distance. Lord Hunt will always remember another incident. In 1953, while we were training before we went to the foot of Everest to climb the mountain, and this was a training camp at about 17,000 feet, heard a wailing cry across the glacier at half a mile away. In fact, a series of sort of yelping calls, long drawn out, wondered what on earth they were. 
was a long, wailing, long drawn out call and it was repeated. Possibly something like a peacock. From all of his research, both in the Himalayas and the Pacific Northwest, Peter has gained a clear picture of the snowman, a composite of its appearance and habits. Imprints left on the ground give me a view of its stride, its enormous loping gait. The stride averages from 40 to 50 inches. From the depth of the footprints, I know it's a heavy creature, more than 300 pounds, and it's extremely agile, jumping mountain crevasses with ease. For all its great physical strength, it appears to be shy and docile, eating small rodents, roots, and berries. But there is no record that it has ever harmed a single man. In search of, we'll next go with Peter Byrne to Nepal, where he hopes to find absolute proof that the snowman exists. The people who live in the villages of the Himalaya mountains are called Sherpa. Despite their shy, mild-mannered ways, these people are capable of rugged climbs with incredibly heavy pack loads. They form the backbone of any expedition, including the successful assault on Everest in 1953. The Sherpa are not the doubters and skeptics that Western men are. Sherpa legends accept the fact that a huge, hairy creature lives among them. They call him the Yeti. To us, he is the abominable snowman. The melting snows of the Himalayas turn the rivers of Nepal into raging torrents. Peter Byrne often takes advantage of their swift transportation in his search for the snowman. The quest has drawn me to perilous but exhilarating places, running the great rivers of the Nepal Himalaya, probably the most dangerous rivers in the world. I had been waiting for two weeks for a most important message, permission for an interview with the Holy Lama of Bodhna. As the messenger made his way to reach us in this incredible world of isolated and rugged beauty, I thought how lucky I was. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the Yeti, or abominable snowman, call it what you may, it has given me times of sheer frustration. But there are also moments of hope. The old Lama, Rinpoche Chini Lama, high priest of the Buddhist temple at Bodhna, has granted me an audience. Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, is one of the few cities of the ancient world unspoiled by tourists. Off regular plane routes, it looks as if it has been frozen in time. But under its calm exterior, a world of intrigue flourishes. Sharing its high mountain borders with Red China, it is one of the very few windows to that world. Agents and spies from many countries jostle each other in the marketplace, with more spies here than in most other cities in the world. Peter Byrne is not concerned with the present. Rather, he has come to Kathmandu seeking a dramatic link with man's distant past. I was looking for eyewitness accounts of Yeti sightings. I hoped the Rinpoche could help. The Holy Lama, I was told, knew of the Yeti at first hand and could provide new clues for me to follow in my search. And as you know, I have been looking for the Yeti. But could not get now. Could not find. You think there might still be a Yeti there? Maybe possible, yeah. Can stay. Sometimes they come down mm -hmm. to destroy the, all the field of corn field and wheat field, potatoes field. They come down to destroy they come these down things. and destroy. And frighten the villagers? Yeah. This piece of bone that you showed me, this is um, a Yeti, a piece of yeah. Yeti bone. How old would you say this was? About 50 years back. 50 years back, I see. It's very thick, and um, it has a peculiar ridge on the top here. I must admit, I've never seen anything like this before. And where did it come from? 
Which place? This is the come from Zarumpu. Following the lead of the Lama, Peter moves up into the Himalayas. His guides will be the loyal Sherpa. At these heights, the weather can close in for days and the temperature drop to sub-zero degrees. One feels cut off in an isolated world of beauty and danger where time is meaningless, where it is easy to believe the incredible tales the Sherpa calmly tell. On my last Yeti expedition to Nepal, I had seen several sets of tracks and heard incredible stories of sightings. This year, I had set out with my Sherpa guides to investigate those stories and relive some of the experiences in the exact location where they said they had heard a Yeti. Peter's guides have not seen a Yeti themselves, but they feel they have been close to the creature many times. As he listens to their stories, Peter will have to differentiate between legend and fact to divine the line between imagination and reality. The oldest Sherpa told an eerie tale. It was a winter afternoon, he said. Two of us were returning from the Tibetan border. And on the last stage of our journey, a storm forced us to camp in a deserted cave. We made our way deep inside where it would be warmer. we heard what we thought was someone calling out and coming in our direction. Peter's guides tell him they saw huge footprints around the mouth of their cave, but happily, no sign of the creature itself. Peter continues his own search. The next morning, in the fresh snow, we saw a set of newly made tracks of a creature walking on two legs. As Peter leaves the Himalayas and his Sherpa companions, he continues to believe more than ever that the snowman exists. His plane rises from the highest airstrip in the world. Peter looks down on a world so vast and so remote that indeed it does seem possible for a rare species to remain hidden, unseen by man, for centuries. I believe in the man-beast. There's historical evidence there's the enormous habitat that can feed, support, hide them. And there's the very, very good evidence of the continuing eyewitness reports. The most compelling evidence Peter has ever heard is from mountain climber Don Willens. Willens recounts what he saw in the Himalayas in 1968. During the night, uh, I got to thinking about this creature because there seemed to be some kind of an atmosphere. Certainly the Sherpas had gone very quiet. I say there was this feeling around, a sort of feeling of being watched in some way. I had a feeling that whatever it was, was still around. I felt that quite definitely. You get used to, when you climb a lot, you get very used to trying to pick out small dots of people against the mountainside. And very often what you think is people are rocks, and very often, you know, what you think is rocks because they don't move when you want them to, turn out to be people. And uh, I thought, well, I'll just, I'll note the position of all the dark parts, it could be rocks, and I'll just see if any of them move, no matter how slowly. Anyway, I was just beginning to get a little bit cold, and I thought, oh, well, you've imagined it all. When suddenly I was sure the position of one of these rocks had moved. So I watched for a couple of minutes, and then suddenly I, I saw this rock definitely move. It started bounding up the slope. <laughs> and that was the last I saw of it. 
course, people come up with all kinds of suggestions about why didn't you set up a camp and follow it? It's absolutely ludicrous. And uh, then they say, uh, uh, well, uh, couldn't you have taken a gun up and shot it? My own personal feelings, which I'm sure wouldn't be shared by a game hunter or a fellow that worked in an abattoir, uh, is that if I did it, it would be murder. If this creature had survived for hundreds of thousands of years, who am I to go around shooting it? My feeling was the best of luck, mate. If you survived up here and I've had the luck to see perhaps something of you, I, for one, felt quite happy that uh, it buzzed off doing its own thing because uh, this is something that's very difficult to do isn't it, in this day and age. Just before completing this episode of In Search Of, we spoke by telephone with Lord Hunt in London. He had just returned from the Himalayas, where a reunion was held of the original members of the Mount Everest climb. One night during that reunion, while camped near Mount Everest, each member of the group was awakened by cries outside their hut. This cover of the English Geographical Magazine shows us what they discovered in the morning. Clear tracks of some huge two-footed creature were found nearby. Lord Hunt photographed those tracks, and this is one of those photographs. After more than a quarter century, new evidence of the abominable snowman.